Namo myo ho renge kyo, namo myo ho renge kyo, namo myo ho renge kyo. Hi there. <laughs> Welcome, good friends. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice. And uh, I certainly hope this finds you in good health, good spirits, and secure. The former affairs of the Bodhisattva Medicine King. It's a little bit about the history of Medicine King. Now, once again, I'm going to start right off the bat by making this clear. I know you hear me say this a lot, but you may be new here. This may be the first video you've watched on this channel, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So you can use the search on the homepage of this channel, that little magnifying glass in the middle of the page next to the uh, playlists and about right there. Um, and look up search terms, particular terms. You'll find a result set of videos that talk about that and pick and choose from that. And the playlist, very useful for like these series on a particular translation of the Lotus Sutra, or maybe it's the Virmalakirti Sutra, the Surangama, or maybe issues about chanting or uh, how that works. All key words you can find videos about, right? So Bodhisattva Medicine King, is this an actual person? Okay, Buddhism uses the mechanism of personages. Shakyamuni used the mechanism of personages to identify mindsets, accomplishments, certain spheres of activity, behaviors, ac accomplishments, as I've said, or um, levels of learning, right? And because he teaches through parables and stories and uh, analogies and so on and so forth, um, like no, no different in the West and in Asia uh, or Europe, your Eurasia as it's called, um, was certainly in Shakyamuni's time, storytelling was a form of embodying an experience. So the medicine king Bodhisattva implies a certain level of study, learning, experience, and at the same time, um, identifies with some characteristics in the name what the stories were about, what aspect of our lives they're about. Okay? So, at that time, the Bodhisattva beflowered by the king of constellations, yet another personage, addressed the Buddha, saying, asking a question, O world-honored one, how does the Bodhisattva Medicine King travel in the Saha world? In other words, how does this particular activity, this personage, show itself in the behavior of the mundane world, the physical realm? Hmm? O oh, world honored one, this Bodhisattva medicine king has to his credit several hundreds of thousands of myriads of millions of nayutas of difficult deeds, of painful deeds. Very well, O oh, world honored one, I beg you to explain a bit. For the gods, dragons, yakshas, gandharas, ashuras, garudas, mahoragas, humans and non-humans, as well as the bodhisattvas, come from other lands. And this multitude of voice hearers hearing shall rejoice. So the, the reference, the use of the word gods here is very off-putting to me, but it's misleading, especially to Westerners, right? Um, so really we're talking about, again, what Nietzsche identifies as the, well, Tendai uh, or ZE identified as the 3,000 realms. The influence is constantly inculcated in each moment of potential Manifesting, right? There are any manner, if you know anything about uh, quantum fields or uh, quantum, what's the other term? Uh, there's a zero point energy where fluctuations are super subtle and not amounting to anything until there's some, some, some kind of um, an impetus, a, a, a rub, a, something that, uh, that disturbs that quietude and immediately 
innumerable reactions occur, right? The instantiations from potential from this group, this amalgam of change, of flux. Hmm? So, at that time, the Buddha declared to the Bodhisattva, be flowered by the king of constellations, quote, in times past, <laughs> okay, sorry about that, in times past, beyond kalpas as numerous as the sands of innumerable Ganges rivers, he's taking shortcuts with his <laughs> expansive descriptions of time, because by now we get the picture, right? This is a timelessness thing. Impossible to identify, right? A beginning or an end. Certainly in practical beings, and if there's any purpose to Buddhism, is practical, pragmatic, living this life to the full. Period. That's all Buddhism is about. But you have these expansive storytellings because you're dealing with a 2,700-year-old civilization of people who are very culturally inclined to magical, mystical thinking. So you have to talk in terms that, and to this day, we have this in all cultures, this tendency toward magical thinking. Yeah. The Buddha named... There was a Buddha named Pure and Bright Excellence of the Sun and Moon. Obviously a very bright man. Uh, thus come one worthy of offerings a right and universal knowledge, his clarity and conduct perfect, well gone, understanding the world, an unexcelled worthy, a regulator of men of stature, a teacher of gods and men, a Buddha, a world-honored one. Boy, a lot of epithets for this same clarity of mind. And I, I would uh, uh, encourage you to look up each one of those and see how they dovetail into one another. Um, could be a source of insight for you. But basically, we're talking about somebody who's attained a fully enlightened mind. That Buddha, which hence is why he's called the Buddha, had 80 millions of great bodhisattva mahasattvas and a great multitude of voice hearers equal in number to the sands of 72 Ganges rivers. Is it different than 71 Ganges rivers or 73 Ganges rivers? No, the point is that he influenced a great number of people. Hmm? The Buddha's his lifespan was 42,000 kalpas and the lifespan of his bodhisattvas was also the same. The re that realm had no women, hell dwellers, hungry ghosts, beasts. Now, that's an unfortunate uh, reality in the translations. We don't know that Shakyamuni actually said this. I would suspect not because he was, uh, although there's different reports. The truth of the matter was, uh, 2,700 years ago, women were property, if that, right? So there's a lot of misogyny. And yet, Shakyamuni was convinced by his own relatives, a woman and his cousin, to start uh, the monastic uh, assembly of nuns, of women. Because as we've learned in one of the chapters in this very book, Women can become enlightenment, enlightened just as well as any man because it's not about their sex, it's about their mind, their sentient mind. That's what Buddhism is about, the mind, attitude, intent, right? So there you have it. And here we have some aspects of translation, identifying a land that's so wonderful that it has no women in it. Well, good luck keeping that land going, right? Makes no sense. It's not logical. But it's a, it's a vestige of a politically charged misogyny, isn't it? Anyway, let's just drop it and move on, shall we? Because it's not relevant to our modern times. Its land was flat as the palm of one's hand, made of iduria, adorned with jewel trees. All, all this indication of the land, same kind of mythology. The idea is no stress. This land, this Buddha land, is not stressful. No diversions and distractions like sex, which is really what the woman thing is about. Hmm? No hard mountains to climb, no big rivers to cross. Everything's flat, beautiful, sunny day. It's kind of Disney. <laughs> you know, birds tweeting, little animals and chipmunks chirping at you. Right? Get the picture? 
draped with jewels, floral banners. Evidently, people like shiny things. They still do today. Jeweled pots. Uh, and its terraces were fashioned of the seven jewels. Trees uh, alternated with terraces. The trees being removed from the terraces, the distance of an arrow shot. All those jewel trees had bodhisattvas and voice hearers sitting under them. So he's surrounded by like-minded people and students, yeah? The jewel terraces each had atop them a hundred million gods making divine music and singing the praises of the Buddha as an offering. In other words, nothing for positive vibes. Posit that's a good way to think of these, this word gods in terms of Buddhism, right? Good vibes. I'm thinking I'm hearing the Beach Boys in the background. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's good, but anyway. At that time, that Buddha preached the scripture of the Dharma Blossom, this scripture, this Lotus Sutra. Really? Why would he say that? Like some previous incarnation of a Buddha taught this sutra when he's gone through so much trouble saying this is the first time this is going to be taught ever. Again, Buddhism is about the mind. This is about attitude and potential. So all previous Buddhas, emanations of Shakyamuni that he brings up in these stories are all a, an inherent state in the engine of life, in the universe. And in that inherent state, there is one overriding truth. Myoho Renge Kyo, right? Not words, but a conceptual understanding for a sentient mind of a, an a priori truth that engine of which the cosmos and all of the things within it, including you and I, are manufactured moment to moment by. So when he says this Buddha from millions and millions of Ganges, sands of millions of Nayutas, blah, 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 time without beginning, taught this sutra, he's not speaking literally. He's saying this truth has always existed. And those aware of this truth lived in a perfect land full of jewels. Yeah, get it? It's really a simple, simple concept. But if you get wrapped into the words, oh my goodness, are you going to go down some rabbit holes? Yeah. <laughs> All right. At that time, the Buddha preached the scripture to the Bodhisattvas, um, Bodhisattva seen with joy by all living beings. Long name. And to the many bodhisattvas and the multitude of voice hearers, the shrakas, right? This bodhisattva, seen with joy by all living beings, desiring to cultivate, uh, cultivate painful practices, there was always those that liked the idea of ascetic practices in order to achieve some transcendent knowledge, within the dharma of the Buddha, pure and bright excellence of the sun and moon, went about persevering with vigor and single-mindedly seeking Buddhahood for a full 12,000 years. Now, did he live 12,000 years? Once again, this is hyperbole. It's about the level of dedication that somebody might dedicate to a particular task. Okay, 12,000 year dedication is pretty serious. He then obtained the samadhi that displays all manner of physical bodies. I imagine so. Samadhis being not just meditations, but uh, states of mind, uh, 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 awarenesses, how shall we say it? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Epiphanies, right? He attained epiphanies of all manner of physical bodies. Well, yeah, if you're going to, you ever been on a diet? Any kind of privation that you put your body through makes you consider things about the nature of your body that you've never considered before. Sounds in your gut, feelings in your mind and throat, and right? Many considerations. This is the whole device of privations or asceticism. After he had obtained this samadhi, he was overjoyed at heart. Suddenly, he felt he understood his body in so many more ways. Therefore, 
somewhat enlightened, right? Or on the path to. Straight away he had this thought, saying to himself, my ability to obtain the samadhi that displays all manner of physical bodies and is entirely due to my having contrived to hear the scripture of the Dharma Blossom. He connected it to the teaching of the Lotus Sutra. That's quite a feat. I will now make offerings to the Buddha, pure, bright excellence of the sun and moon, and to the scripture of the Dharma Blossom. Straight away, then, he entered into this samadhi. And in open space, there rained down Mandarava and Mahamanadava uh, flowers, while a finely powdered, uh, hard, black kandana, filling all of space, descended like a cloud. There also rained down the scent of the kandana of the near seashore. Six shu of this scent, having the value of the Saha world sphere, which, uh, with which he made an offering to the Buddha. This is all incense and incense from different sources, so on and so forth. After he had made this offering, he arose from his meditation, his samadhi, and thought to himself, Though by resort to supernatural power I have made an offering to the Buddha. Hey, stop it. Sorry, my little dog. Still in training, obviously. <laughs> um, doop, 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 doop. I made this offering to the Buddha. It is not as if I made an offering of my own body. Oh, the ascetic thinking, right? Straight away then he applied to his body various scents, kandana, kunda, ruka, uh, turuska, uh, two kinds of frankincense, prakka, uh, the scent that sinks in water, and the scent of pine tar. And he also drank the fragrant oils of the kampaka flower. Um, not unusual back then. Uh, I watched a, a movie recently about the blue lotus as an aphrodisiac in Egyptian times. It's all over the hieroglyphs, this blue lotus. Anyway, in other words, consuming flowers was not unheard of or grinding them up in a powder and putting, making a tea out of them, so on and so forth. When 1,200 years had passed, uh, had been fulfilled, he painted his body with fragrant oil and in the presence of the Buddha, pure, bright excellence of the sun and moon, wrapped his body in a garment adorned with divine jewels, anointed himself with fragrant oils, with the force of supernatural penetration, took a vow, and then burned his own body. With words like burned his own body, and this is, English is a very uh, minutely dissecting language, Whereas uh, we're dealing with uh, dialogues that were spoken in Prakrit, uh, an informal Sanskrit-like language, which was full of intonations and sounds and rhythms, much more conceptual in its building blocks than what we call words, which tend to be minutely specific and modifiers and all of that. Um, but once again, uh, back to the personage. This is a personage. So a personage doesn't burn its body. It is a type of thinking, an attitude. And so we read constantly in Buddhism that I will follow this line of reasoning to my enlightenment even at the expense of my own body because everything having to do with the physical body is the detractor that causes us suffering on a very basic level, right? That's the dividing line, the mind versus the attachments, the emotive uh, cravings and, and fulfillment or clinging. We th that's, that takes place in the mind, but it's entirely motivated by identifying self as this mundane physical thing. And so if we're following a teaching of the mind to enlightenment, then, of course, at some point, you have to do away with all distractions having to do with this body. That doesn't mean kill yourself. That's not about annihilation. It's about shifting your mind's 
analytics of your experience to the actual experience rather than the subsistence of that experience via physical means. Like if I just collect enough, insert avarice here, money, jewels, tennis shoes, clothes, haircut, women, men, sex, how much of what physical thing do you need in order to know that you exist and that you're important? None of it. It's all artifice. It's all in t impermanent. F right? Ultimately, it's how you think. How you experience the world is a reflection of who you actually are moment to moment to moment to moment. Buddhaness is simply that clarity. Hmm? So when he says that he doused himself in all these fragrances, he's simply making the greatest offering he can, not only, I mean, burning the body can't smell good. <laughs> so why not cover yourself in incense and oils so that as you liberate yourself from your cravings and clingings, which is what this really means, you at the same time provide a wonderful glow and incense as an offering to enlightenment. So you don't actually burn your body. What you burn, if there's anything burnt, is again a simile, a, a metaphor for burning your cravings and clingings so that you completely dedicate yourself to the Buddha mind, Buddhaness, enlightenment. Follow. The glow gave light all around to the world spheres equal in number to the sands of 80 millions of Ganges River. There you have it. It's about the glow, the light of acceptance of this teaching of the Buddha mind that spreads. Nobody brought marshmallows. <laughs> Within them, the Buddhas all at once praised him, saying, Excellent, excellent, good man. This is true perseverance in vigor. Really? Would you say that to a burning person? Wow, that's great perseverance in vigor. N no. The perseverance and vigor is in the dedication to realization of the true state of the engine of life. Moment to moment, moment to moment, moment. The cycle, right? Birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. Realizing it in the moment, experiencing it in the moment, free of the anchors of clinging, right? and the fly fishing of cravings of future that doesn't exist, be here in this moment. Experience the totality of life. Not just you, mundane you, but you, cosmic you. This is called a true Dharma offering to the thus come one. Is this an offering to a person? No, it's an offering to the thus come one. What is the thus come one? The thus come one of the process of potential into instantiations of everything in the cosmos. One. This is the oneness that you hear people trivially talk about in Buddhism. We're all one. Mm. Who's the we in that statement? People don't really understand what that means. The oneness is a momentum, it's an activity, it's the energy instantiating moment to moment. That's what ends differentiation. We are all, we, the planets, the sun, the cosmos, my, my relatives, my siblings, you and I, the same energetic momentum uh, instantiating and a, a huge amalgam of karma, of tendencies and conditions, influx 
moment after moment after moment, moving through what we build in our mind as time and space. That's our reference measurement, right? Because after all, we're still physical beings. But our mind can transcend the limitations that the clinging and cravings of this bodily self can create obstacles to our fulfillment. Hmm? All right. If with floral scents, necklaces, burned incense, powdered incense, paint incense, divine cloth, banners, parasols, the scent of the kandana of the near seashore, and the variety of such things, one were to make offerings, still they could not equal this former act of yours. Even if one were to give realm and walled cities, wife and children, they would still be no match for it. Of course, because those will all be offerings of the physical world. The offering here is psychological, mental. Hmm? Good man, this is called the prime gift. Your mind's focused realization. Hmm? And the gift is to whom, really? It's to your own Buddhahood, not to some other. It's the thus come one. That is the nature of all phenomena. Ultimately, it's a gift to ourselves. Among the various gifts, it is the most honorable, the supreme. For it continue, uh, constitutes an offering of dharma, experience, to the thus come ones, all those who participate in this experience. When they had made this speech, each kept silence. What more is there to say? His body burned in the fire a thousand two hundred years. <laughs> in other words, the light, the enlightenment he provided with that shift in his mind, in his attitude and intent, affected for a very, very long time, all of those who witnessed it. You see, it's always the same analog. When this had passed, his body was then consumed, because the Bodhisattva, seen with joy by all living beings, had made such a Dharma offerings as this. After his life had ended, he was born again in the realm of the Buddha, pure and bright excellence of the sun and moon, where... In the household of King Pure Virtue, Vimaladatta, he was born suddenly by transformation, sitting cross legged, straight away to his father, he proclaimed Agatha. So, this process is ongoing. It's not the same person reincarnated, it's the same attitude and intent being embodied in new life. O oh, great king, now be it known that I, going about in that place, straightway attained the all-body displaying samadhi, whereby, striving and greatly persevering in vigor, I cast off the body to which I had been so attached. Isn't that exactly what I've been saying? Not physically casting off the body, mentally casting off the body that he had been so attached it's the attachment that's the issue, not the things. And where does attachment take place? It's not like we have handcuffs to everything we ever owned or thought of connecting us to things. It's in the mind. When he had proclaimed this gatha, he addressed his father, saying the Buddha pure and bright excellence of the sun and moon is still present. Having formerly made offerings to that Buddha, I have already contrived to understand the dharani of the speech of all living beings. I have also heard this of this scripture of the Dharma Blossom, 800,000 of myriads of millions of Nayutas, of Kankara, Vivara, Akshobha, and the 
like of Gathas, O great king. I will now go back and make offerings to that Buddha. When he had spoken, he straightway sat on the platform made of the seven jewels and rose up into open space to a height of seven tala trees. He went into the Buddha's presence, made obeisance to his feet, with head bowed, joined his ten fingernails, and with a gatha praised the Buddha. Joined his ten fingernails. Never heard that one before. O most wondrous and fine of countenance, whose bright glow illuminates all ten quarters, formerly I've made offerings to you, and now once again I come to behold you in person. So, if you could just, like Superman, go up into the sky to encounter Buddha, what does that mean? Do you actually fly up in the sky? And is Buddha just hanging out on a cloud up there and we don't know it? Of course, this is a mentation, yes? A samadhi, a meditation, a, a commitment, attitude and intent to be honorific, thanking, thankful, grateful, hmm? profoundly so. At that time, the Bodhisattva, seen with joy by all living beings, having proclaimed this gatha, addressed the Buddha, saying, World honored one, world honored one, you are still in the world. Well, yeah, because Buddha-ness is the engine of life. If there's a world, there's Buddha. At that time, the Buddha, pure and bright excellence of the sun and moon, declared to the Bodhisattva, seen with joy of all, by all living beings, good man, by, by the way, again, the reference of the name, seen by joy of all living beings, isn't that the, ref, the because of the light that he put out for 12,000 years? What was the light? The mental attitude and intent. The realization. Hmm? There's a reason it's called enlightenment rather than endarkenment. Hmm? Good man, my time of nirvana has come. My time of total extinction has arrived. You may lay out my couch and seat, for this night I will achieve parinirvana. So as his mundane body ceases, so too will his sentient mind and therefore all attitude and intent on his behalf will be extinct. That doesn't mean the influence he had in his life will be extinct. But if you make the mistake of attaching mental condition to physical body as inexorably connected, then you're going to think, as Shakyamuni said earlier in this book, that I'm leaving, Buddha, I am leaving, right? Parinirvana. And then everybody panics. What are we going to do? Well, that's because you still don't understand. You shouldn't be panicking. Because Buddha never leaves. Just this, this body with a mouth and a mind to communicate to you. But this is something you do with yourself. It's an individual practice. It's something you encounter. It's self-realization. It's always there. You simply need to awaken it in your mind. Your mind already has this capacity. But they're still attaching Buddhahood to the man. <laughs> How hard has he worked to break them free of that thinking? <sighs> Again, he commanded the Bodhisattva seen with joy by all living beings. Good man, I entrust the Buddha Dharma to you. Also, Bodhisattvas and their great disciples, as well as the Dharma of the Anuttara Samyak Sambodai, perfect and complete enlightenment, also the seven jeweled world spheres of the thousand million fold world, the 3,000 realms, yes. It's jeweled trees and jeweled terraces and the, the gods, the influences, the realms who wait upon it, I entrust entirely to you. After my passage into extinction, whatever 
Sarira, there may be, I entrust to you also. My ashes, my remains, I entrust them to you because there's still this physical attachment going on. So you might as well treat that with some reverence, some capacity of honor, even though pff, I'm extinct, right? It's a conundrum, isn't it? You are to spread them about and broadly arrange for offerings to them. You are to erect several thousand stupas. In this way, the Buddha, pure and bright excellence of the sun and moon, having commanded the Bodhisattva seen with joy by all living beings, in the last watch of the night, entered nirvana. Well, pouty nirvana. Yeah? Final. Now, I'm sure as Nietzsche read this, can, you can easily see in this last paragraph that what he bequeathed to him, erecting stupas, seven jewels. Isn't this what the altar is? Isn't that the Butsudan, a stupa, with a mandala, a perfect mandala of this ceremony in the sky, the treasure tower itself down the center, the assembly indicated by all of the other symbols, calligraphy? Hmm? Where are we time-wise? All right, I'll go a little bit further. At that time, the Bodhisattva, seen by joy, uh, with joy by all living beings, seeing that the Buddha had passed into extinction, was sore moved, was so moved, typo, with grief and longing for the Buddha. Straight away, using the kandana of the near seashore for firewood, and as an offering to the Buddha's body, he then burned the latter, Right, because that's the way we Buddhists like to go, cremation. Again, trying to liberate ourselves from that damn body. When that, well, I didn't mean damned. I just mean that, you know, the attachment, the craving, the clinging, it's so hard to get rid of. And uh, if this book is any reminder of that constantly, right, it's talking about you and I as well. When the fire had gone out, he collected the sarira, whatever remained in the ashes, and making 84,000 jeweled pots, with it erected 84,000 stupas, the height of three world spheres, displaying chatras as ornaments, draped with banners and parasols, and hung a multitude of jeweled bells. At that time, the bodhisattva, seen with joy by all living beings, again had a thought, saying to himself, Though I have made this offering, at heart I am still not satisfied. Not satisfied because the experience of enlightenment, complete freedom, liberation from the samsaric delusions, it, it's so amazing that to make physical offerings, it's never going to add up, is it? So he still wanted to do more. So guess what he did? I will now make still further offerings to the Sarira. He then said to the Bodhisattvas, their disciples, the uh, influences, dragons, yakshas, others, to all the great multitude, you are all to attend single-mindedly. Listen up. For I will now make an offering to the Sarira of the Buddha, pure and bright excellence of the sun and moon. Having spoken these words straight away before the 84,000 stupas, he burned his forearm. Again with the burning. Oh, but not his whole body this time, just his forearm. Attitude and intent, right? Still the same attitude and intent. I need to break free from this physical craving and clinging. Physical is fine. It's the mental craving and clinging that's the problem. Adorned as it is with, uh, was with a hundred happy qualities, making this his offering for 72,000 years. Pretty profound commitment. Thus causing a numberless multitude seeking the rank of voice hearers incalculable asamkayas of human beings to open up their thoughts to Anathara Samyak Sambodai. Did he cause all those living beings to burn their forearms? No. That's not the point. He raised their at seeing that level of commitment, thought, I can attain Buddhahood, right? Aspiration for Anuttara Samyak Sambodai. 
enabling them to dwell in the samadhi that displays all manner of physical bodies. Hmm? A deep, profound reconsideration of what it is to have this apparatus of the cosmos, the planets, this physical body, this brain, to emerge a sentience, a sentient mind with all nine consciousnesses. Hmm? That's a powerful visualization in order to attain matching moment to moment with the flow of life rather than impeded by cravings and clinging of temporary mundane instantiations. They're all fun, but they're not your life. Mm. This, this razor's edge of division, it's, it's hard to perceive of the division itself, let alone experience the shift. Hmm? All right. We're going to end today on that note, and we'll continue this chapter, the former affairs of the Bodhisattva Medicine King. And, uh, yeah, we'll be able to finish in the next one. It's only a couple of pages. So that'll be fun. We'll see how this ends. Now, in China, most notably, although it still happens in the recent history in Southeast Asia, where monks used to read that literally, did not understand that it was about attitude and intent, and thought that, well, I can do, I can, I'm so devout, I can do what Medicine King did. Really? You're going to do it for 70,000 years? I mean, these people, they didn't make sense. They didn't think clearly of the teachings of Shakyamuni. And you'll hear stories, you can read stories, you can find them online, of monks that have gone to the center of town and set themselves on fire. And to me, that's such, on the one hand, a tragedy of humanity, but also an affront, I mean a deep affront, to the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. Ugh, how, how can someone so dedicated to the practice of liberation and Buddhaness not value their life enough to spread the teachings which everything in the Lotus Sutra is saying to have an impact for 70,000 years. You can't do that if you're a pile of ashes. You're not going to imprint anyone for very long. It's just tragic. So, yeah, that's not the ultimate teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha or even reflective of Buddhism. It's something else. That's a religious obsession. So, make sure you understand this is all about the mind, your attitude and intent. Isn't that what conducts the, the, the sensations of your life? Moment to moment, every single day. That's where Buddhaness is. By achieving that, your cravings and clingings, your attachments, they will just disappear because they're conjured in the mind. And if your mind is shifted, through the brilliance of being, moment to moment, there's just no space-time to go, where's my stuff? It's all here. <laughs> Am I making that, that dividing line clear enough? Yeah, I've talked about it in many different ways in different videos, but 
we're running into it again. Every time I read the Lotus Sutra, doesn't matter the translation. Boom, boom, boom. We keep hitting this. Obviously, this is the merit of the teaching, not the words. This is what it's about. This division, this paradigm shift in the mind, yeah? I hope this is making some sparks fly in your mind, some insights, some clearer understandings. We'll keep going. If you have questions about it, many of you email me or speak in the comments. Whatever is more comfortable to you, I will respond. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your practice. And thank you for your support. Even if all you can do is like and subscribe, that's a bodhisattva act. It helps grow the sangha. It's the algorithm thing. Yeah. And those of you who've bought ebooks, continue to buy ebooks, buy print books, buy a mandala, correct? Nietzsche and inscribed mandala. Well, digital copy anyway, right? I, don't forget all the free stuff, right? The podcasts, all the free information on threefoldlowest.com. All the links are in the descriptions. You know what to do. Thank you. Thank you for your practice and your support. Please take care of your health. And I will see you in the next one. As always, bye for now.